this is Mr. Brass, and today will be the start of a series on the so-called Dark Ages. I say so-called because some distinguished people like medievalist Roger Collins don't even acknowledge the Dark Ages really. The long dismissed by historians conflict narrative between science and religion has become a stable in the anti-theist community. The idea isn't new, and it comes from 19th century thinkers Thomas Huxley and John Draper. It's funny to see how time has wandered back with the anti-theist movement. Their go-to guy would be like the philosopher slash mathematician John Lee Ron D. Almert, whom said, funny enough, in his time in the 1700s, that rational men could throw off the shackles of religion. They do have a tinge of the Anglican scientist Francis Bacon in them, as like him, they do find that science should be used for a ground of um, human moral value. Although, Francis Bacon did devote his life to studying nature because he thought it would be useful for converting Muslims to Christianity before the apocalypse. So, I digress. The bad reputation of the Middle Ages in general can be traced back to the 16th century when humanists championed classical Greek and Roman literature and were against medieval scholarship because of its complexity and that it was written in barbaric Latin. Protestants also didn't want to give credit to the Catholics, so they joined in on the bashing, and Voltaire, being the arguer he was, joined in as a way of bashing religion in general. Humanists of the Protestant Reformation rejected philosophy of the Middle Ages and were less tolerant of new ideas. Even the term Gothic, as in the Gothic cathedrals, was a 16th century labeled, which was labeled that way so in order to jab at the structures for not being classical like the Greek or Roman architecture. Originally they were just called French as that was where the first ones were at, in France. Another factor is where the notion of social progress has its roots in. As John Gray, an atheist English political philosopher points out in his book The Silence of the Animals on Progress and Other Modern Myths, the notion of social progress has its roots in Christian narrative of sin and redemption. We can see this sort of played out where history tends to be divided up into three groups. The Renaissance, which is good, the Dark Ages, which is bad, and the Enlightenment, which is good. This whole outlook of progress can be seen as going back to the 19th century France, where historians had the idea that the past was mankind's progress towards their time period. In this series, we'll be going over the historical significance of the so-called Dark Ages. The philosophy, theology, science, and stories of prominent thinkers of the time will be discussed. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
500 AD and 1500 AD. Medieval Europe invented the windmill, blast furnace, and spectacles as well. The Industrial Revolution itself owes itself to Middle Age inventors. Medieval scholars used the work of the classical Greeks and expanded upon it and developed systems of thought which made science flourish and did more so with universities being invented. The Middle Ages also made great advancements in technology for horses which made them better for riding and going to war like iron wor horseshoes. Ancient medieval Islam had great success as well due to the fact they had a hard time calculating which dis direction Mecca laid due to the Muslim expansion. Scholars had to study the position of stars which helped influence increase what on um, what to know about astronomy and trigonometry. The Byzantine Christians did preserve most of the important scientific Greek works independently like Islam had done on its own. Muslims innovated things like philosophy, mathematics, and medicine with the Arabic origin of the words algebra and algorithm to show their merit. Also, with Muslims, Charles the Hammer Martel would defeat Muslims at the Battle of Poitiers, and after that they would never have be a serious threat to France and Europe was secure. His grandson Charlemagne would usher in an age of learning and help unite people through, though, although he did do so partly under forced conversions. To make a final point in this video, it has been claimed that Leonardo da Vinci's aka a 15th century Italian polymath had his scientific work oppressed by the Catholic Church or hid them from the church. This isn't the case and it was because Leonardo was secretive in general and that is why his work didn't get let out. He refused to tell people about his work and, and what we know about his science comes from his notebooks that appeared centuries after his death. Overall, the early Dark Ages made remarkable progress in many fields. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be talking about Pope Sylvester II. Pope Sylvester, aka Gerbert of Ariac, was a man who went from the humble beginning of a farmer for the monastery to Pope Sylvester II. He had been promoted to the monkhood by others who seen him as having great talent. He traveled to Barcelona, where he'd be taught mathematics by Muslims and introduced Arabic numerals to the West and put them on an apagus. He was also well versed in astronomy and made models of it. He'd become a teacher for Emperor Otto III whom would promote him to Emperor. He wouldn't be a great Pope but rather just a better Pope than previous ones before him who sunk into corruption and sexual deviancy. He wasn't much of a politician and didn't have much of a power base due to him being given a position by the Emperor which didn't help him. Gerbert did think that the earth didn't move and was at the center but this was a common line of reasoning at the time and with the lack of telescope and maps for it Gerbert can't be blamed for not knowing. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. Hello there everyone, this is Mr. Brass, and today we'll be going over some claims about the supposed cosmological ignorance of the Middle Ages. It has often been claimed by people like Neil deGrasse Tyson that people in the Middle Ages believed the Earth was flat, when in actuality, while few people existed, as they do today sadly, scholars of the day didn't believe the Earth was flat and had known so from their own studying and reading up on the ancient philosophers like Plato who said it himself. 13th century astronomer John Sacubasco gave rational proofs for the shape of the earth.
Earth. Another common misconception is that because the people of the Middle Ages thought the Earth was in the center, that it made the Earth special. This is false because they thought the opposite was true. They believed the universe was a hierarchy universe, and the further away you were from the Earth, the closer you were to heaven you were, and so having the Earth at the center meant you were further from heaven. Moving the Earth from the center moved it towards the stars, which was a good thing. They liked the geocentric model of the universe because of its neat order, but had no problem endorsing contrary models provided evidence could be shown for them. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. Hello there, this is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be talking about St. Anselm of Canterbury. St. Anselm of Canterbury was 11th century philosopher slash theologian. He lost his mom and his dad sent him off to be educated by his uncle, who beat him, which was a common practice back then by teachers. The experience made St. Anselm denounce the beating of children. He'd end up going to Beck and became a monk and gave up his inheritance. He'd become head of a school. Anselm created the ontological art argument, which wasn't an argument to convince skeptics, but to show people who believe in God that such a being is necessary. And some believed in faith in search of understanding. Philosophers have had a hard time repeating it, as even Bertrand Russell said, it is easier to feel convinced that it must be fallacious than it is to find out precisely where the fallacy lies. He'd become the Archbishop in 1093 after his mentor died, but he really wouldn't do well as he couldn't get along with the kings of the day and he was exiled twice which many argue he preferred more. He would die two years later after this last exile in 1107. Well that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs> Hello there, this is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be talking about the logic in the Middle Ages. The 11th century was noted for using logic to weed out heresies. Nominalism versus realism was widely discussed in the medieval period, with people arguing over were there actually sheep or was it just an arbitrary name we applied to fluffy white animals. They also debated substance versus accidents, which were applied to the Eucharist and transubstantiation, as the French theologian Berenger challenged it by saying that bread and wine have only been come to known as the body of Christ. It was argued that while accidents are the same, aka things like the taste, its substance was still ultimately Jesus Christ. Hundreds of years later, this idea would be challenged with atomism and by anti aristotelian French philosopher Nicholas of Autrecourt, whom would be labeled a heretic for that, and other ideas would be denounced by such by the Catholic Church. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. there this is Mr. Brass and today we're going to be talking about the advancements of the 12th century. The 12th century can be seen as a renaissance as scientific and medical work and ancient Greek and Islamic works would be translated into Latin and the information could be assimilated and progression from that could be made. To gain more knowledge Christians would battle Muslims who tended to be fighting amongst themselves and they took their libraries. Here are the tales of some prominent 12th century thinkers. Peter Abelard was a 12th century 
French philosopher who attended the Cathedral School of Notre Dame in Paris, where with its unregulated educational system, teachers had to compete with others to show they are logical, and they had to attract students for their money. He believed in reason over faith by saying nothing can be believed unless it is first understood. He saw them both as gifts from God, and if there was a conflict between the two, it was because there was a mistake in the argument. He also taught that the Jews could not be guilty of sin for killing Jesus because they thought they were doing the right thing. Peter would be known for his affair with Halois, another scholar whom he admired for her looks and brains. She'd be known for how she could outsmart the men in the school with her knowledge in Latin classics. He'd become her tutor, and during that time, they'd become loved and needless to stay, studying and teaching declined for both of them. While Peter made it seem like they enjoyed rough play, he did beat and rape her. They'd be found out and eventually returned to his home of Le Palit, where Heloise was, gave birth to his son. They would get married in secrecy after making a deal with her uncle, but word would get out and he'd have to give her up to the nunnery. Heloise's uncle would then, in revenge for that, have Peter castrated, making him unable to be a husband. He'd become a monk, but he would again strike controversy again multiple times by claiming other monks weren't holy enough, writing a what was deemed heretical book on the Trinity and said St. Denis, a.k.a. the Saint of France, didn't exist, which made him have to flee to the wilderness. He'd become an abbot of a monastery in Brittany, only to have the monks try to kill him. Abelard would return to France as a master in logic, only to be later be confronted by St. Bernard of Clairvaux on his updated a treatise on the Trinity, and St. Bernard really only disagreed with him about the use of reason and theology, and there was a dispute where St. Bernard knew he couldn't beat Abelard in a debate, so instead accused him of heresy, and then Abelard took the matter to the Pope. He would be found guilty of heresy twice in 1121 and 1140, and while we may think the church was against reason and logic, it must be noted that while Abelard was no doubt a great teacher, he was also a very controversial figure, which didn't help his case out more, and it could be seen as a case of politics over anything else. Despite his final condemnation in 1140, he would still have his supporters, such as Peter the Vulnerable, who made sure Abelard could serve out his confinement in his monastery with comfort. Abelard would die of old age, and his body would be given up to Halloween for burial, and the Pope whom condemned him died around the same time, and the new Pope was a supporter of reason. His ideas in regard to logic would come to dominate Christian scholarship after after his death. Second up is William of Conscience, who was best known for his reconciling of the natural philosophy of Plato and Timotheus with the Bible's Genesis. William would state that taking a literal understanding of parts of Genesis would be absurd. He championed the notion that you have to look at the primary and secondary causes where God is the primary reason anything happens, but what way God has attained his aims could be asked which would be the secondary cause of the event. Under this view, nature obeys the laws God ordained in the world, and the philosopher doesn't threaten God's omnipotence by investigating natural laws, as nothing is stopping God from intervening and causing a miracle, and knowing the normal cause of events would allow the ability to be able to recognize something as a miracle. Third was Abelard of Bath, who was a natural philosopher who specialized in mathematics, who went to Syria to learn mathematics from the Arabs. He translated elements by Euseid of Alexandria, which is considered the finest work of Greek math. His science was wrong as he thought lust came from women with excessive moisture, and that stars were alive, but not because of superstition, but because of rational inquiry. Fourth was Gernard of Cremonia, who was a prominent um, scientific translator whom translated over 60 books on science, math, and philosophy. His work with the Algamest, aka the Arabic title for Ptolemy's book, Mathematical System, opened up the door for mathematical science. He also translated commentators and treaties from scholars like Avicenna and Averro, one who was known for their work in medicine and the other for um, one for annotations on Aristotle. With Aristotle's treatise on physics, the soul, and metaphysics, translated in the 6th century by Bothius, the, the books would form the basis of European natural science. Due to the fact the treatises were just lecture notes that he pulled together and never intended to be published in their own right, it came across as, the, as rough, while Plato's were the opposite as they were intended to be published. Aristotle did 
write his own literary dialogues, but they have been lost. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
the way out to the Middle East to weed out the Muslims, and so they targeted the Jews as they viewed them as heretics. Church laws at the time had protected the Jews, but that overall didn't stop the mobs of extremists from killing thousands. Even though bishops were protecting Jews, that couldn't stop the mob. It was a common fear that you'd be hurt if you allowed heretics to live peacefully amongst you, and so people reported it quickly. The church needed a new process for dealing with heretics like the ever-growing Cathars, and they came up with a legal process known better today as the Inquisition, which was pretty fair on the whole. While the church accepted that an unrepentant heretic deserved death, they wanted to offer heretics chances to come to the faith. Inquisitors were simply individual agents who went to areas with large amounts of heresies and worked in accordance with secular and church authorities in sorting matters out. They used the latest legal techniques, which consisted of them appointing a lay judge to investigate the crime, interview will witnesses, examine the evidence, and reach a verdict. This was much better than the older trial by ordeal method. Basically speaking with heresy, the lay judge would be an inquisitioner, but who was appointed by the Pope, and this system of doing business would be good that, that it would spread to the secular system, and it is seen in the criminal investigations in Europe today. Inquisitors followed strict rules and only seriously punished people who stubbornly refused to change, or were repeat offenders whom could get life imprisonment. Second chances were a must. Mercy was to be given to heretics who gave themselves up. Arrest would be made and interrogations would be done. Torture was very rare and generally speaking if someone was found guilty of heresy, he or she were given a chance to recant and were just required to do a lenient self-punishment to themselves aka a penance. The worst that the church could really do is give up a heretic to the secular authority whom would kill the heretic. The church didn't kill heretics themselves. Executions in of themselves were rare, only happening in 5% of cases in the surviving records, and reserved, and they were reserved generally for high-ranking heretics and relapsed ones. Now, even so, we generally have moral objections to this. Like, how could they punish people like that over religious beliefs? Well, a first thing you have to keep in mind is not to be a presentist in regards to history, aka judging history by your own moral standards. Religion back then was a public and shared ideal that united communities to help them survive. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today I'll be talking about the Dominicans and the Francescans. Groups known as the Dominicans and the Francescans came about from their founders Dominic Guzman and Francis of Assis, who helped evangelize the masses, participated in the Inquisition, and were known for seeking the best education. The Dominicans were known for their intellect and were better than the Francescans at their job, although that could be attributed to the doctrine dispute Francescans had. The best two men Dominicans had were Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas. Albert the Great was was a German Dominican friar and bishop born in Laguien, Germany in 1200. He was known for his massive scholarship with a standard edition of his work filling out 38 volumes. His work on Aristotle and its natural history and science earned him the name the Universal Doctor. He'd read on nature and Aristotle and would admit when Aristotle's findings contradicted what he knew on nature. He isn't all that remembered outside of Germany largely due to how he was more known for being like a fact collector rather than someone who was extending the reach of his field. His pupil Thomas Aquinas would be much better. Thomas Aquinas was an Italian Dominican friar and priest who was considered legendary in the Catholic Church for his contribution to philosophy and theology. Despite being born to a high class family, he would join the Dominicans and would beg for food to show his piety, which would lead to his family imprisoning him in their castle and trying to tempt him out of his commitment, but he overall refused. They would release him and
and the Dominicans would move him to Cologne, Germany. After he got his doctorate in theology, he'd stay a friar his whole life, even though he was offered to be an Archbishop of Naples. Thomas would get into the whole Aristotle craze in Paris, which then employed arguments from the 12th century Muslim scholar Avarios, who said that the universe was completely deterministic with no free will and moral responsibility allowed. Thomas would create the scholaristic method, which was a very intricate and well-ordered process, which involved starting with a, a question, laying out the objections to the questions, then delivering his arguments for his position, and then finish off by responding to the initial objections. Thomas would come up with the five ways, a.k.a. a series of logical arguments for God's existence. His response to things like the problem of evil was that God could draw good out of evil events. Thomas engaged with Sigur of Brabant, who was an avarinous philosophy professor who endorsed the idea that faith and reason conflicted, where reason said humans were soulless living on an eternal earth, while faith said that humans had souls and God did create the universe. He combated Averroes' ideas in general, showing how while reason had its limits, it was a great tool for philosophers and argued for free will and for souls. Thomas would quit writing after having a spiritual experience, calling his work bad in comparison. He would die and be made a saint only a couple decades later. Theology and philosophy would be made separate in 1272, where philosophers swore not to meddle with matters of theology. The Bishop of Paris, Stephen Templer, freed up philosophers with his 1219 condemnations of 1277 by saying not to say that God was constrained in how he could organize the world, thus allowing them to break free from strictly Aristotle and allowing them to go outside that, while also not having to worry about metaphysical speculation. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be talking about magic in the Middle Ages. Magic in the Middle Ages is sort of a weird topic to bring up in history due to the topic in of itself and how you define it. It had really nothing to do with the supernatural. Back in the day, scholarly medicine worked with both miracles and magic, and funny enough, magic healers did less damage than the physicians at the time because they didn't require patients to throw up or to bleed them. In 1300 France, you have two options, but a third if you had money. You could go to the church, a local healer, or if you had the money, a qualified doctor. The first two were at a much lower price, and the church had hospitals, but they were subject to crowds. Generally, magic healers prescribed non-poisonous medicines for exterior use only and were generally safer than the professional physicians in terms of harm done. This could be partly because physicians at the time stood to make money by having their patients die. The church had no problem with healers as long as they didn't engage in bad magic as God was ultimately responsible for the illness but provided the means to get better. People did generally not rely on just religious help and they took alternatives when they could. Your best bet was to go to a healer. It tended to be a respectable, literate woman who would charge a reasonable fee and give you a treatment which, like even treatment from physicians, wouldn't cure you but would just treat the pain. A thing she could do is give you an amulet and a walnut alcoholic drink for your headache. This was because they saw edible parts of walnuts, like the human brain, as both uh, had a harder shell like a skull but contained a soft interior, aka like a brain, that was divided into hemispheres. This was known as the doctrine of signatures. This was seen as God's way of showing man which plant to use for an ailment. This wasn't, this didn't always work as walnuts didn't cure headaches, but willow bark did as they contain the aspirins, they contain the acids that are used for aspirins. In the Middle Ages, there was a difference between magical cures and miracle cures. A magician's cure should always work while a miracle cure didn't have to work as God could have his reasons for not curing a person and wasn't obligated to heal you. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise.
this is Mr. Brass, and today I'll be talking about the concepts of the microcosm and the macrocosm, along with sympathy and empathy of the Middle Ages. You can divide battles of philosophies on this t into two different areas. Microcosm, aka the surface of the earth and, and or the human body, versus the, micro, the macrocosm, aka the whole universe, especially the stars, and the second battle between sympathy, aka the idea that different parts of the universe were connected together so that various things that corresponded to each other showed an outward sign of the fact, and empathy, which was the, the exact opposite of that. These were dichotomies of m medieval magic. Generally, healers then believed everything that was caused on earth corresponded to that on the heavens, and the importance of the signs can be seen. They also had ways of associating things such as pure metals, gold, silver, mercury, copper, iron, tin, and lead, to things like the sun, moon, mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These played a huge part in the practicing of science of the day. That's all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today we'll be talking about medical practices in the Middle Ages. If a patient was rich enough to get a doctor, they'd be treated on an individual level where the well-educated doctors of the universities would ask questions about their medical history and measured patterns in pulses and urine in order to diagnose a patient. They'd prescribe vomit-inducing medicine and would regularly bleed their clients in an effort to cleanse them of the sickness. When and how you'd be bled or treated depended on the stars, aka astrology was used. They ultimately got the idea of bleeding from ancient Greek physician and torture of animals Galen, a par paragium, and his theory of medicine, which was that the body contained four humors, aka blood, phylum, yellow bile, and black bile. It was assumed that someone was sick because he or she had too much of one of the humors, and the key to health was balancing them by draining them. They figured out which humor was which by assigning qualities of hot and cold along with wet and dry to them. They checked the symptoms and see which they corresponded with in order to know which to drain. Blood was labeled as hot and wet. Phylum was labeled as cold and wet. Yellow bile was labeled as hot and dry. And black bile was labeled as cold and dry. Generally, a doctor would also tell you you're sick pessimistically because if the man got better, it made the doctor look good. And if he didn't, then you could just say he was too far gone. It was better to go to a healer. The placebo effect would be just as active with the healer and going to a physician who used Galen's methods would likely do more harm than good. Praying at a saint's shrine was the best treatment you could get and likely it's the prestige of the Greek legacy and degree that helped keep the medical practices of Galen alive then. Italian doctor Tadio Autorati was famous for being the first to organize a medical faculty at a university. Before him, doctors were just seen as craftsmen due to them using their hands on a lot of tasks. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today we'll be talking about astrology and alchemy in the Middle Ages. Astrology and alchemy were widely held practices in the day. Astrologers would be skilled at math in order to calculate the positions of the stars, and astrology was believed to allow astrologers the ability to predict the personality and influence people would have in their lives. People would learn it in order to make money, although it did come with its negatives. In ancient Roman times, astrologers would be killed after making a prediction in order to keep the word of the prediction from 
getting out. Christians were known for being initially against astrology as the Bible forbade all forms of divination and Acts of the Apostles had an episode where new converts burned all their books on magic. St. Augustine in the 4th century denied astrology work due to how twins born under the same stars could have different fates and that all accurate predictions from astrology came from evil spirits. St. Augustine's work was overruled partially because Roman mathematician and astrologer Polemi wrote a manual on it called the Tetrabiblios and with Polemi and other classical writers and the love for ancient works astrology came to be more respected. Initially the church supported Augustine but became more lenient as it became popular due to the fact that astrologers had made the defense that what they were doing is just forecasting future events based by physical laws and they weren't trying to learn the future events of man and thus as long as astrologers were studying the natural effects the stars have on the earth they were fine. The church also when challenged on free will because of it just said that while the stars can't cause the choices of man that doesn't mean that they can't incline him to do a certain action. The church repeatedly said free will is a thing. The church looked at alchemy and astrology with suspicion which prevented magical worldviews from becoming dominant while also allowing them to be free to scientific thinking. Alchemy, unlike ast astrology, was not a very profitable affair and, and in fact people lost money doing it. Alchemists wanted to find the philosopher's stone in order to turn base metals into gold. Alchemy would also gain a bad reputation because people would try to pass off fake gold as the real thing. Pope John the 22nd denied the possibility of an actual transformation from base metals to gold. Secular rulers, however, like King Henry the Sixth, did think there was something to it as he granted licenses to people who said they could make gold at will, which caused obvious problems. While alchemy's goal of turning base metals into gold was ultimately a failure, they did discover hydrochloric, sulfuric, and nitric acid in the 13th century. Christian alchemists also extended the range of metals beyond the seven known to the Greeks. Alchemists, however, didn't weigh the materials before and af after chemical reactions. It wasn't until much later in the 18th century that chemists did that. Both alchemy and astrology relied on occult forces, aka unseen properties or forces, and they had very different sellable rates. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
this is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be talking about medieval ideas of motions. Medieval people for the longest time took Aristotle on his physics, and Aristotle believed in two types of motions, aka the natural and the violent. Natural motion was the idea that falling objects were striving to reach their proper place. Its weight determined its place as the heavier objects were low to the ground and lighter objects would raise up. This would require no force of gravity. Violent motion, however, was any kind of motion independent of the natural. Picking up a rock was considered a violent motion. Aristotle's view led to a strange result as it didn't predict curved trajectory really and it said that a projectile will move in a straight line until it slowed down and dropped out of the sky. Aristotle's work also didn't really accept the idea of action at a distance and it wasn't until the 13th century when French scientist Peter the Pilgrim worked on magnets and on their polarity and that the idea was challenged. That is not the only thing Aristotle would be wrong on. He believed a heavier object would always fall faster than a lighter one, that vacuums and atoms don't exist, and he believed the Earth was stationary and not located at the center of the universe, that no object would continue moving without some other object moving it, and etc. People would generally take Aristotle's word on it, and it wasn't until much later when natural philosophy would be grounded and it would surpass him. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
Masters of Art degree before the money ran out and would officially join the Benedictines and would profess to be a monk so he could complete his studies. He would also come up with the Albion while studying theology. The Albion is a calculator that helps determine the position of the stars. It was quicker than using the tables of the time and a full understanding of underlying mathematics wasn't necessary for it. After leaving Oxford in 1326, he would become an abbot after the old one died. He'd come to manage the Abbey of St. Albans, where he would work the farmers and townsfolk to help him fund his advanced clock. He built the clock for the church in St. Albans, and it wouldn't just tell the time, but would also provide the time for the tides for the nearest port for the monks, a.k.a. London Bridge. He'd die of leprosy in 1336, and six centuries later, neglect would catch on with the clock, due to it being expensive to maintain, and it would later be destroyed alongside a lot of the medieval work during the Reformation. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. Hello there, this is Mr. Brass, and today we'll be talking about the Oxford Calculators. The Oxford Calculators were a group of mid-13th to 14th century intellectuals who helped give Oxford a reputation as a leading philosophical center. John Dunn Scottish, William of Ockham, Richard Swineshead, and Thomas Brad Warden are among some of them. John Dunn Scottish was a 13th century Scottish theologian who was known for criticizing Thomas Aquinas' work. He did agree with Thomas that human rights rationality could prove God exists by itself, but felt Thomas had subjected God to dictates of reason with his idea that the universe had to reflect God. He thought the idea was flawed and that instead God could make the universe any way that he wanted. This helped science as it allowed natural philosophers to speculate on all sorts of possibilities that once had not been considered. Next up we have William of Ockham who was a 14th century English philosopher best known for the razor named after him. He would join the Franciscans around 1300 and would drop out of Oxford before getting his doctorate in theology in around 1320, likely due to the fact that he wrote a seemingly heretical commentary on sentences by Peter Lombard, and he refused to change it and instead ran to the Holy Roman Empire to write political propaganda in exchange for protection from the church. Occam believed human reason wasn't sufficient to discover the truth about the world, and especially God on top of that, and that only experience and faith could do so, which challenged the rational theology laid out by Thomas Aquinas. His way of thinking became known as the New Way, which caught on to the newer generation. Much of the disagreement between the new and old ways came down to the age-old debate between realists and nominalists, where William fell on the nominalist side, which is how we get Occam's razor. William held that multiple entities should never be invoked unnecessarily, which meant you should reject explanations that posit the existence of things from which we have no direct experience of. Nominalists like Occam tended to be more empirical than their realist counterparts and were at an edge because they were more willing to reject Aristotle if need be, and Occam himself would dispute Aristotle's notion that a moving object had to be moved by something else. Thirdly, we have Thomas Brad Warren, who was a 14th century Archbishop of Canterbury. He studied at Merton College for 12 years before becoming a chaplain for King Edward III of England for the Hundred Years' War. He had been nominated for the Archbishopship which it took a while for him to become officially anointed and he would die of the plague just 40 days after. Thomas was more famous for the challenging of Aristotle's theory of momentum of objects as he believed that mathematics revealed great truths and that Aristotle's theory should be able to be described as a mathematical function. His theorem of the laws was ultimately wrong because it assumed the truth of Aristotle but it did show that it was possible to do such formula and its use of the 
logarithms show that such a system was was in limited use for 300 years before it became officially invented by John Knapper in 1614. Lastly, we have Richard Swineshead, who was a 14th century mathematician best known for his book of calculations, which showcased the limits of mathematics of the day, for he imagined situations that analyzed situations in which heat and speed were decreasing at various rates. It wasn't until William Heightsbury later on came up with the mean speed theorem, which describes the motion of an object falling under gravity without accounting for weight, which came into being. Nicole, Nicole Orsimi would later on prove it with a graph. Sadly, people couldn't see the significance of the theorem, and after 1350, for more than 200 years, no notable mathematicians or philosophers emerged from England. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
everyone, this is Mr. Brass, and today we'll be talking about the Renaissance and Desiderius Erasmus. The popes of the late 15th century were horrible as they battled for secular power in Italy and used money from the church for lavish parties and building projects. The real plus side of said popes and what they did was they promoted beautiful art which would be so dazzling that it helped promote what we now call the Renaissance. The period lasts from the late 14th century to the early 16th century. The term was popularized by Jacob Burkhardt, a 19th century Swiss historian in his 1860 work, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. Burkhardt also espoused the idea that the Middle Ages were a stagnation which has been discredited by modern scholarship. If anything, the Renaissance was, if anything, more superstitious and violent than the Middle Ages. The Renaissance spawned humanists, aka people who were deeply interested in classical Greek and Latin literature, and called the Middle Ages barbaric, where nothing good came out of it. While they did do a lot of damage, they did reintroduce ancient Greek to Europe in its original language, and they made knowledge of ancient Greek required if you wanted to look smart. They very much loved Plato and Platonism, and it became more popular with the likes of the Italian humanist Catholic priest Marsilio Ficino, an Italian humanist who embraced it and believed Plato got his ideas from Moses and from aka what is now called Hermanitism in order to show that belief in the soul was rational. The arguments didn't succeed in taking Aristotle out of the universities though. Because of their belief in the ancient wisdom, they completely disregarded the Middle Ages. Its progress and believed the older the better, which retarded growth by like 300 years. The writings of guys like William of Ockham and John Dunn Scotus weren't focused on as much and the philosophers had their names dragged through the mud. The word Dunch, which refers to a stupid person, was a play on John Dunn Scotus name and Richard Swine's head was seen as a tyrant and many books of the philosophers were banned. Their focus on speaking Latin, like how the Roman orator Cicero wrote it, contributed greatly to the killing of the of the language due to the fact that the language was supposed to be more adaptive and they forbidden that. Science didn't suffer as much because the old books, if anything, were still preserved well. One of the greatest scholars in the Renaissance was Dissodeus Armasus, who was a Dutch humanist and scholar. He was known for making a Greek New Testament in 1516. Armasus was adopted by the church but grew to not like it and sought to just study at the University of Paris and received a good Latin education which helped his writings. He wrote a very popular satire book in 1511 called Praise of Folly which assaulted the culture of medieval culture and his language would be used as a device to attack Catholicism. Well that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be talking about the fight between Catholicism and Protestantism and the result of the Reformation. The Reformation started on October 31st, 1517, when German theologian Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church, which, while this moment is always looked at so dramatically, it really wasn't. Martin was a theologian, and such theses would just be seen as a matter of debate. He did bring up some good points against the Catholic Church, as he spotted corruption within the church as the church basically sold forgiveness of sins for money, which Luther rejected and believed that you didn't need ancient tradition and needed just the Bible alone. Luther would, after a bit of a standoff with Emperor Charles V, would go into hiding in Wartburg. John Calvin was a French theologian known for creating the Calvinist group. His Calvinist group made up the backbone of English national churches, and Calvin himself was responsible for the execution of Spanish doctor Michael Servetus, who was killed because
because of his Unitarian views he espoused in his book, The Restoration of Christianity. Calvinists believe that God elected people into heaven and you had to sort of hope you were one of them. Michael Servetus was known for critiquing the Gallen way of thinking, especially with what he thought of the heart and circulatory system. There would be bloodshed in a variety of ways between the Protestants and Catholics. King Henry VIII of England was best known for his fight with the Pope over the fact that the Pope refused to let him divorce his wife because she wouldn't give him a son. Now Henry would still remain a Catholic and would kill Protestants but would also extend his killings to the people loyal to the Pope as well. Henry's daughter Mary I took over and she burned 300 Protestants for Catholicism and earned the nickname Bloody Mary. When she died Henry's other daughter Elizabeth I took over and killed just as many Catholics although her reason was that of their loyalty to the Pope and not because of religious reasons. Catholics would later fight back with their counter reformation where they stomped out the undesirables in the church and combated the movement head on with great success. Religious toleration between the groups more or less became necessary after so many battles with one another and they just overall decided hey I'll just be happy to see you in hell. Contrary to what other groups will say there is no evidence that Protestants or Catholics outdid each other in science back then. They had theological differences sure which caused chaos in the universities as they were removing teachers left and right but their science was pretty much the same and so no matter what who was in charge they pretty much were being taught the same thing. English history tends to be marked with an anti-Catholic bias due to the fact many Protestants wrote the history books but once you remove that the balance of the scientific uh, advancements goes really evenly on both sides. Well that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today I'll be talking to you about... Um, the popularity of astrology and alchemy in the later periods. The reason why things like astrology and alchemy were so popular back in Newton's time and even up to the modern era has to do with Hermetism. As I've mentioned before, Marcillo Ficino was into that and believed through a manuscript that was found in the Macedonian monastery that a sage Hermes Tris Trismegistus was an ancient seer who was contemporary of Moses and whom Plato got his ideas from. Hermes' writings were believed to contain secrets about a race of magicians. It was found out later in 1614, however, that a hermetic corpus was a forgery, but the damage had already been done, and the document gave rise to the renovation of occult practices. Many people like the English magus John Deere and Italian polymath Jerome Cardin wanted to reinvent astrology and had success doing so. John Dee was a teacher and lecturer who traveled throughout Europe to teach geometry, and he sought to put astrology on a firm scientific ground because of his background in that. Back in his day, astrologers were really only criticized on religious grounds and not scientific grounds. John Dee's scientific explanation for astrology was that planets gave off rays which would influence your life given intensities of the rays based on planets moving around the sky. The math it would take to do this would be beyond the scope of mathematicians of the time, but it showed that mathematics was being advanced long enough. Astrology then demanded accuracy in plotting the the planets, which also increased mathematical ability of the time. Girolamo Cardino, a.k.a. Jerome Cardin, by name alone shows you how important he was. Back in the Renaissance ages, if you were given an anglicized name, that meant your name was widespread and famous. His astrology had told that he would live a good life but die young, but this would turn out to be false as he lived to be an old age. Jerome would study medicine at the University of Pavia, where in order to make ends meet, he would sell himself out as a tutor for math, and he would become a gambler. While gambling was frowned upon during that time in Italy, that didn't stop it from appearing everywhere, and Jerome Cardin invented the science of probability to help him be a better gambler. Cardin would become a great physician to fund his astrology dreams. He was great due to his non-interventionist treatment, 
where he simply recommended a healthy diet and rest, Cardine would give the same treatment to Archbishop John Hamilton, which helped him recover and doing so made him the doctor to be. Cardine, like by D, sought to reform astrology, but did so through a more empirical approach by gathering horoscopes as many people and compared the predictions of those many people to how their life turned out to be in order to formulate the rules for it which is similar to how we do science today. Cardine was also an inventor and invented what we now call the Cardin joint aka device that allows a spinning drive shaft to bend. This is found in cars today. Greek mathematician Archimedes was a very advanced mathematician for a lot of people but Cardine was able to bring in an audience to him through his writings of books. He was able to, in 1545, publish a book called The, the Great Art, which published the first publicized solutions to cubic and quadric equations. The last years of Cardin's life weren't that great. His eldest son, Giovanni, murdered his own gold-digging wife and was executed in prison. His youngest son, Aldo, had to be exiled from home and from the city due to his criminal behavior, and his daughter, Chiara, had no children. Due to his fame, his colleagues would become jealous and start rumors about him and smear his work and had him arrested by the Inquisition, although his horoscope of Jesus Christ played a part in that, but was released on bail and was given a pension from the Pope for the trouble and was given a respectable retirement. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. Hello there everyone, this is Mr. Brass, and today I will be talking about Gallian medical practices and the challenges it faced. Often it is assumed that there weren't a whole lot of challenges to the Gallian medical practices due to its long-standing use. This isn't true as there were doctors that challenged the Gallian treatments of the time. For one, Theophratus Bombastus von Huttenheim, or Paracelsus for short, was a 16th century Swiss physician who was known for using alchemy for his medical practices. He criticized the Gallic medical treatment and suggested the use of drugs he devised as better as he believed that illnesses was caused by individual diseases but the problem is since this is early on treatment with drugs he had no idea what might work for said illnesses and he and his followers would prescribe mercury a lot of times which was a deadly poison he'd have some acts success he'd have some success as a healer because gallon medicine was that bad Paracelsus didn't have have their best reputation as he was labeled a drunk and a troublemaker for his actions. He once burned an important medical book in the public square. He wasn't a precursor to modern medicine as his work was imbued with theological speculation and only objected to Gallen on grounds that it was pagan. He also subscribed to the doctrine of signatures as we talked about before, so he was wrong on that front as well. It wasn't really until after his death in 1541 that his books got published and a new school of medicine came out based on him. The Paracelsian medicines would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Gallinist and eventually Gallinist would win and Paracelsian medicines were banned at the University of Paris in 1615. Surgeons back in the Middle Ages were looked down upon as they used their hands and they challenged Greek thought on healing. Greeks believed letting the wound rot was necessary for healing while people in the 13th century believed that cleaning the wound with wine, drying, and and binding was the best method. What would also challenge the Galenic me um, medical practices is the introduction of human dissection. Contrary to popular opinion, the church had no problem with human dissection during the Middle Ages. In fact, Pope Innocent III had ordered the procedure to happen for a murder victim. By the 13th century, Italy started doing human dissections, which would come out about and would challenge Galen's work by showing his mistakes. The first dissections could have been done for legal 
legal reasons and over time it became done for medical purposes. While it was allowed, it typically was only done for teaching purposes and not for research. Bolognese physician Madino de Lazusius manual on human dissection became part of the course for carrying them out. It was considered taboo in most cultures at the time to cut open bodies as it was deemed disgraceful to the dead. Really the only examples in ancient time we can find being ex this human dissection being explored was in Alexandria in the 3rd century BC which could be because they had already had to remove organs anyway from mummification. The dissection of human bodies was forbidden by pagan Roman authorities which meant Galen himself had to use his work on animals which caused problems because he assumed animal physiology was the same as ours. There were also great physicians of the 16th century. Andreas Vercellius is considered one of the pioneers of autonomy. He was the 16th century Thalamus physician best known for how he could do dissections himself and his work would be written on it. Funny enough he didn't do his work to debunk Galen but to simply perfect it as he seen Galen as just being limited by animals. His work on the fabric of the human body was a massive success. It isn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination as it was sexist as it just seen a woman's reproductive parts as just an inverted penis waiting for a man to thrust into it. Even the word vagina has sexist origins as it is Latin for sword sheath aka the thing you put your sword into. Vasilius would also grave rob due to the shortage of bodies and would kill a prisoner so he could operate on his body. He would get a job with um with the king and eventually Vasilius left Padilla and was employed by King Philip II and as a personal physician would not like the job as he couldn't operate on dead bodies anymore and decided to seek an escape by going on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem which would result in his death as the boat sank on its return journey. Last off we have William Harvey who was a 16th century physician best known for describing in detail and describing the systematic circulation of the brain and body. He got his education at Cambridge University and attended Callius College. He would do his research at home by performing operations on live dogs and would help him gain insight into how the heart worked. He thought of the heart as operating like a machine. Harvey was a devoutly religious man who wanted to find out what the heart had been created to do. Our understanding of the heart is still based on Harvey's work. However, people still did gallant practices even though they were being challenged because there was no alternative and people's in Harvey's work wouldn't in Harvey's work didn't lead to an immediate effectual clinical practices so they just simply stuck with what they had well that is all for today this is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise everyone this is Mr. Brass and today I'll be talking about polemy and astronomy. Natural philosophers of the 16th century were able to build better on the work of the Middle Ages in the fields of astronomy and physics. The realization of polemy's mistakes have their funny origins as they can be formed and they can go back to the debate between 15th century scholar George Trapezontus and John Bassaron. The debate was over who Greek's philosophy was better, Plato or Aristotle. At the time Italians wanted to translations of ancient Greek philosophers and George gave them what they wanted but he worked carelessly in a rush and made mistakes which John pointed out. John would become a cardinal while George had to flee to Naples due to the debate harming his reputation. While in Vienna John met the emperor's court astrologer Gorge von Bierbach and sought his astronomical advice to help him engage in a good second round against his opponent. In 1450 George published a translation of the Polemy's Augmest, which failed as he didn't show the mathematical skill required to do work on it. John, to revel in his opponent's embarrassment, asked Gorge to produce a summary of the Algamist. He'd complete six of the thirteen books before he died and passed the work on to Riggio Montanius, whom would complete it in 1463 and spent the rest of his life making new observations, which advanced mathematical techniques in order to correct 
Greek and Arab astronomy. His book on triangles, which is a guide to trigonometry, may have had influence from Richard of Wellington, whom wrote a similar sort of work in the early 14th century. Riccio Montanius was at least aware of him because he did have a copy of his work on creating of an Albion. Riccio Montanius may have died of poisoning by Trapezontus for taking part in Basarion's scheme, which would not be uncommon for politics of the day. George and Riccio Montanus were instrumental in pointing out the Plum's and Ptolemy's model, and their books spread throughout Europe and were given to students. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. everyone this is Mr. Brass and today I'll be talking to you about Nicholas Copernicus and the astronomers. Nicholas Copernicus was a late 15th century Polish astronomer. He is best known for his book Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres which he published around the end of his life and it claimed that the Sun was at the center of the universe and that the earth orbited around it. There are some misconceptions about Copernicus that I want to clear up. He wasn't a lone smart man working at the fringes of Europe who came up with the idea of heliocentrism on his own, but instead he was a smart man who lived in Poland, which at the time was very rich. They had a king named King Sigismus I, who was a powerful monarch in Europe. Copernicus would take a Latin name in order to show how he had links to the international elite, and was brought up by his uncle, who was a bishop. He studied at the University of Krokow for a while, before moving to Italy to continue his education, in which he would get a degree in canon law. His uncle would give him a cannery, which paid well for, her, for little work and allowed Copernicus to study astronomy. Copernicus's first heliocentric universe ideas appeared sometime after 1507, which were looked at as wrong. Copernicus decided to keep working on it so he could produce something that could withstand criticism. He would read Regio Montanus' work and found that the mathematics used were what he needed for his work, and with that, his book Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres were made. Copernicus couldn't provide a direct demonstration of the Earth orbiting around the sun, and the evidence against it was strong due to the lack of a stellar parallax. His theory also proposed the universe was much larger than it was thought to be at the time, which was against the principle of parsimony. His friend Andreas Asander added a foreword to the book, saying that the book was meant to be seen as a theory and not a fact. Contrary to popular opinion, he faced no threat from the Pope, and the book was even dedicated to Pope Paul III. Not long after this book was published and his death, the Catholic Church church would use Copernicus's work to help reform their calendars. The reason why he waited so long to publish his book was because of all the scientific objections against it. It can be shown how open the church was by noting that in 1533, Pope Clement VII got Johann Weidenstadt to deliver a lecture on Copernicus's theories and was even rewarded for it. Copernicus got his ideas that the earth orbited the, the sun partly from his belief in God because he felt that the current models of the universe as promoted by Polemy were messy and couldn't have been designed by God and spent a lot of time searching around books of philosophy for an alternative. Nicholas would find Astrodarchus of Samos, a Greek astronomer who believed the earth orbited the sun. Now he would take his name out of the final version of the book so he could focus on the Neoplatonism Marcello Ficino who preached that which inspired him. Occultism played probably a great deal in his his work, as many occults in Italy at the time worshipped the sun in a sense and placed at the center of the universe. He'd also lift the argument for the rotation of the earth straight from John Burdine and would use theorems from Muslim scholars. While heliocentrism was a radical idea at the time, it wasn't entirely Copernicus's own making. At the time, proposing a moving earth just wasn't seen as the best theory that supported the data and experts were against it. There was good scientific evidence at the time against the theory, aka constant to scientists at the time, it was expected that if the Earth was in motion, we would expect the stars to change 
versus their relative positions as Earth followed its orbit. This is called the stellar parallax, which is solved by the fact that the stars are very far away. Although many astronomers didn't believe in his work, they did think it was good and that his system was easier to apply than existing alternatives. And simply before the 1600s, not many people believed he was right. To move on to the next part, it is good to note that the 16th century would be a time for astronomical activities with many famous men who would contribute to the field. First off, we have Christopher Clavius, who was a German astronomer who had to deal with a rather interesting time frame. In 1572, a supernova occurred and was visible on Earth for about 15 months. Astronomers remained puzzled at this as they wondered where it had come from as this whole thing didn't fit the traditional view that it was an aberration in the atmosphere. Clavius collected all this information and found that the position of the nova was exactly the same for all observers. That the supernova had to be beyond the moon and the doctrine of the heavens could, that, they, that the heavens couldn't be changed had to be proven false. And he acknowledges as such in 1585 on his astronomy textbook. Second, we have Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe. In 1577, a huge comet appeared in the sky and Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe scrutinized its movements alongside others. He placed the comet's parallax beyond Venus and his work had the implication that if the planets were carried on the surface of giant solid spheres, the comet would have to be passing through them, which contradicted pure box impenetrable shell idea, which he would reject but would still hold to Polymy's impenetrable shell idea. His findings made him conclude that the Earth was stationary at the center of the universe with the sun and moon going around it, but the other planets were orbiting the sun. Lastly, we have William Gilbert. William Gilbert was a 16th century English doctor. He went to St. John's College in 1558 and by 1569 would earn a medical degree. He built up his practices and entered the London College of Physicians in 1581, solidifying himself as a top doctor. William's claim to fame came from with his studies of magnets, which he got into because of the occult properties of magnetism proposed at the time. Magnetism at the time was limited because it didn't cohere Aristotle's philosophy. Its existence was denied, but explanations for its properties were just seen as magical, and works like Peter the Pilgrim were written off. William would do the same pretty much, but didn't acknowledge that Peter was a source for his ideas. William would take his experiments and pair them with theoretical suggestions, which showed you could model compass variation with a spherical magnet, and it suggested the Earth was perhaps a giant magnet as well. William's style of work has become commonplace in experimental science. He honed techniques from alchemists such as their experimental techniques, manual skills, and thorough record keeping. While he has been called a modern man of science, one can't forget that he did think from his experiments that the Earth was alive with magnetism as the soul, and his focus on the occult properties can't be forgotten. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. This is Mr. Brass, and today we're going to be going over the tale of Johann Kepler. Johann Kepler was a late 16th century German astronomer who is known for his role in the 17th century scientific revolution. His eyesight had suffered from an illness when he was a child, and thus his scientific research was hampered to a degree. Kepler was always a very devoutly religious man, and after overcoming the more poor state of his family by winning a scholarship, he'd eventually go to the University of Tübingen with the desire to express his faith as a priest. Kepler, while being a follower of Luther, found himself not agreeing to all the doctrines of the church, which made him unwelcomed in both Catholic and Lutheran circles, although he would spend his time working under Catholic rulers. His disagreements would make him not want to study theology. His research reflected his faith as he believed the structure of the heavens had to reflect the divinity of God, which could be revealed through geometry. Kepler's first book, The Mystery of the Universe, exposed some of his views on the universe. He put the sun at the center 
center and the planets around the sun with the orbits determined by five basic solids, that being cube, tetrahedron, octahedron, isohedron, and dodecahedron, which provided a neat layout to show God's providence. Kepler was a perfectionist, though, and seen errors in his work, which made the model not good enough. Even his best model was off by eight minutes of the arc, which was not good for him as he felt it had to perfectly reflect God. He would work in an unenjoyable relationship with Tycho Brahe, which who had at the time obtained decades of observations at the time of their relationship. They would work together for around six months before Tycho died and his family would still pester Kepler for money so that Kepler could use Tycho's observations. Kepler would still publish the book Rodalfian Planetary Tables in spite of their pest. At the a time of the 16th century, many natural philosophers of the day had embraced a defeatist attitude as the supernova of 1572 defeated the ancient Greek axiom of the immutability of the heavens and the other two axioms were just seen as untrue as well. Kepler wouldn't have had this defeatism due to his religious beliefs as he believed that the heavens had declared the glory of God and that God didn't make mistakes. After much work, he would find how the planets moved and came up with what we now call Kepler's Laws, which consist of three rules. That the period of the time an orbit takes is related to its size, the orbits are eclipses, and the axis of an orbit sweeps through a uniform area. Those are the laws. Kepler was such a devout man that it was hard to read his science work as he seen science as a religious duty and wrote his science in a theological language. Kepler, however, was right and did find the planetary movements because of his faith in God's providence. Kepler's Law really wouldn't be considered mainstream until he published the new astronomical tables of planetary positions, which were considered very accurate and above all other tables of the day. Magic became lessened as the 17th century drowned in, as it made, made laud posts plausible. Protestants had become skeptical of religious miracles, and Catholics were worried about how the hermetic corpus was creating heretical ideas. Witch trolls reflected a decline in the belief in magic, as people no longer perceived as people gained magic on their own, but rather that they saw them as people possessed by Satan. As many of 60,000 people died over 200 years over over the whole witchcraft phase, the magical overview wasn't providing testable answers to them, and people separated numerology from its practical math mathematics. Kepler would swat away a lot of the mathema magical thought himself. Kepler also solved a central problem in optics. It was believed that the only non-reflected rays hitting the eye head-on were the ones that contributed to what we see, but Kepler amended the theory to what we believe today, aka that lens in the eye bend all rays from a particular point, so they all ended up at the same spot of the, on the retina. He also realized that we actually see everything upside down, but our brain flips it as we see it on our retinas. Sadly, life would take a hard turn for Kepler after his discoveries. His three kids caught smallpox with his six-year-old son dying from it. His wife would die months later, and he'd have to defend his mother against charges of witchcraft. He would die at the age of 59. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
mathematics since his attendance at the University of Pisa. He would have a talent for mathematics and his family used their connections to get him a professorship in the field at the university in 1589. Galileo did have some hardships in his life. Being a mathematics professor wasn't a very profitable job and that would result in what you may call questionable decisions on Galileo's behalf. When Galileo's father died in 1591, Galileo had to find dowries for his two sisters and his horrible experience with this carried over to when he had his own kids. While at the University of Padua, he met a woman named Marina Gamba and would have three children with her out of wedlock. His son Vecino became heir to him, but his two daughters were shipped off to a nunnery very early on. Due to his lack of money, Galileo would take on pupils privately and have them rent out a home of his in order to make said money. During all of this, he had to worry about being plagiarized by people. Galileo opposed Aristotle's theory of motion and sought to fix it. His opposition to Aristotle's theory of motion wasn't something that happened in a vacuum and can be traced back to John Birding in the 14th century and from books written on it during his time from fellow Jesuits. Galileo didn't initially know how falling bodies actually moved, but the work of the 16th century theologian Domingo de Suto helped him understand it. Galileo would give the first accurate description of falling objects under gravity in his book on Aristotle. Galileo got in trouble with his belief that science could be proved with certainty, which we know isn't a very good influence, as scientific induction is probabilistic and can be overturned with new evidence. This belief would plague his academic career. When Galileo in 1597 started proclaiming Copernicanism, he had the idea that it was known for certain even though he was one of the few people who believed in it, and the evidence for it at the time wasn't there, and there was actually arguments against it, like the lack of a stellar parallax. The church really didn't have much of a problem with heliocentrism as long as it wasn't asserted as fact. This can be seen by the fact that the men who defended Galileo greatly were his fellow churchmen. They were willing to reinterpret the Bible if need be. Here is a quote from Cardinal Ballermine in his 1616 ruling on Galileo's writings. A far was a, tr a true demonstration that the sun is at the center of the world, on the earth in the third heaven, and that the sun does not circle the earth, but the the earth suckles the sun, then one would have to proceed with great care in explaining the scriptures that appear contrary, and say rather that we do not understand them, then that is what is demonstrated is false. But this is not to a thing to be done in haste, and as for myself, I shall not believe that there are such proofs until they are shown to me. Galileo's 1610 book, Side Real Messenger, gained him much fame. He had used a modified telescope to gain insight insight and showcased how there were more stars than initially thought. His observation countered Aristotle's claim about all heavenly bodies needing to be perfect spheres. He disproved Ptolemy's system by showing that Venus had phases like the moon, thus showing that Venus had to orbit the sun. While Galileo supported Copernicus' model, Tycho Brahe's was considered more accurate by fellow experts. Galileo would become the official mathematician to the Grand Duke of Dissuni, Cosimo Medici. Galileo knew that scripture had supported a stationary earth, but he did a typical way of handling such a problem. He took St. Augustine's belief that the Bible isn't a scientific textbook, and it was written to be understood by the people of his day. As Galileo said, the intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach us how one goes to heaven not how the heavens go. Copernicus would be deemed heretical in 1616 by Robert Ballermann, and the Congregation of the Index of Forbidden Books in the same year would say it's scientifically absurd and that it went against scripture. Seven years later, Robert would be dead and Pope Urban VIII would be in. The Pope admired Galileo and, was, and so was willing to be more lenient on him, only saying as long as Galileo was just proposing Copernicanism as a theory and not as a fact that that would be okay. Urban held to the problem of under- determination, a.k.a. that man couldn't figure out exactly how the heavens worked, and that whatever mathematical model was used, God could change things to get the same result. Galileo would write a book in 1632 entitled Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, which read like a popular science genre. It dumbed down the science so lay readers could get on board with it. He'd have three characters in it, Salavity, who represented Galileo, Sagrido, whom represented a neutral party, and Simplicio, 
who represented a naive Aristotelian. Simplicio would put up the arguments that Savati would refute, and Sagrito would end up agreeing with Savati. Gelli would put his foot in his mouth, though, by putting the problem of underdetermination in the words of Simplicio's mouth, which was the Pope's argument. That made the Pope look foolish, which caused political turmoil. Gelli was put on trial for heresy, although scholars have argued that Pope Urban put him on trial because he felt betrayed by a man whom he had admired, and during the time the Pope was still trying to maintain authority in Rome, so having his authority undermined by Galileo was a big no-no. The Pope would deny Galileo a fitting memorial after he died, and it stayed that way with the Catholic Church for about a hundred years after Galileo's death. The Church is to blame for banning heliocentrism back in 1616, but Galileo can't be said that he didn't contribute in making matters worse than what they had to be. Galileo would be sentenced to life in prison, but that would be commuted down to house arrest. He'd be treated well under house arrest and would write some of his best work during that time without hassle. Galileo would die on January 8, 1642 at the age of 77. He was considered so famous that later on when they moved his body to a new location, fans of his took a couple of his fingers, a tooth, and his vertebrae, and most of them now are on display. Galileo's final book, in 1638 entitled Discourses on Two New Sciences would involve him bringing back the three characters from the last book for a fictitious discussion over four days which would be seen as a representation of all the work medieval mathematicians and philosophers put forward. A fair criticism to give of Galileo is that he didn't give full credit where it was due in his sources. Galileo did however do a better job at demonstrating his conclusions than the others before him. It is good to know that Galileo's work has a a good medieval foundation, and his ideas didn't just come out of nowhere. Niccolo Targhiglia, John Philoponus, Dom Domingo de Soto, William Hatsbury, etc., all were some of the works Galileo worked off of and refined to explain better. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. <laughs>
political statements Gardano made, which were written up by Robert Ballermine, are sadly lost to us, and so we can only speculate on what the statements were. We can say, however, that it is very unlikely that his belief in Copernicanism and in an infinite universe did him in. Copernicanism wasn't declared a heresy until 1616, a.k.a. after the case, and the infinite universe belief was something that Card Cardinal Nicholas of Casa espoused, who never got in trouble for it. Robert was a very nice, albeit conservative man, with a sense of duty, and that reflected with his patience with Bruno. He likely didn't want to see Bruno get killed, and simply wanted Bruno to cooperate with him. But Bruno, like always, caused himself trouble. He undermined his confession of heresy by writing a letter to the Pope, which said his statements weren't heretical. This, tr this was troubling, as he had agreed to recant for the heresies. This was the last straw for the Inquisitioners, as they told him that he could either repent or be given up to the secular leaders. Bruno refused, and so he was sent to the stake where he was killed on February 17, 1600. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. everyone this is mr brass and this is the end of my dark age series i hope you guys have enjoyed it i spent a lot of time studying up on it so as to give you guys the best information and to clear up misconceptions one might have on the issue the middle ages brought about great things for us and they weren't really dark at all and there is really no evidence that christianity stifled science god influenced people in the middle ages as james hannon said in his book god's philosophers however the most significant contribution of the natural philosophers of the Middle Ages was to make modern science even conceivable. They made science safe in a Christian context, showed how it could be useful, and constructed a worldview where it made sense. Their central belief that nature was created by God and so worthy of their attention was one that Galileo wholeheartedly endorsed. Without that awareness, modern science would simply not have happened. The university was a home for natural philosophers and gave students and professors security and intellectual freedom to do their work. The church did set limits on science, although one can argue that a lot of the limits actually helped focus on real manners of importance, and overall most of the stories about the church holding back science is a myth. The Middle Ages gave rise to technological advances which improved living standards. The presupposition for all of the natural philosophy then was that nature was created by God, thus making it legit to study so you could learn about him in the rules he ordained for creation. All the scientific theories developed in the Middle Ages helped shape what we are now. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise.